and he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This sentence, this innocent but all significant sentence, created the time in which we now live. That time, that is, the time in which we now live, is the time best characterized as after the Reformation. Thus, Brad Gregory's argument in his The Unintended Reformation, how a religious revolution secularized society, that the Western world today is an extraordinary, complex, tangled product of rejections, retentions, and transformations of medieval Western Christianity in which the Reformation era constitutes the critical watershed. Our complex and tangled lives are testimony to the significance of how this sentence from Genesis determines how we must now live. In particular, how this sentence was read by Luther has, I believe, made it difficult for us to imagine what it might mean to be Christian in this time when Christendom seems to be wanting. More accurately, how Luther's use of this sentence has been employed by many of us has meant we have forgotten that salvation involves making us citizens of a time and space that is in tension with all other forms of citizenship. As a result, we have been robbed of resources we desperately need if we are as Christians to know how to live in this time after the Reformation. These are strong claims that no one sermon, and some of you may doubt this is a sermon, it is certainly a sermon that can only be preached in a divinity school. <laughs> but let me at least try to suggest why I'm taking the tack, this tack by first directing your attention to what Luther actually says about Abraham. With his, love, with his usual love of exaggeration, a characteristic with which I deeply identify. <laughs> Luther declared in his commentary on Genesis that the 15th chapter of Genesis is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. The 15th chapter has such importance, according to Luther, because there we are told that the Lord reckons Abraham as righteous because he believed the Lord. The sentence in which the Lord reckoned Abraham righteous, Luther argued, is one of the most important sentences in the whole Bible. If Luther had been raised in the South, he would have been even more impressed because of the very fact that the Lord reckoned Abraham as righteous <laughs> clearly indicate that the Lord had a Southern accent. Luther supported his claims about the significance of this chapter and sentence by calling attentions to Paul's use of the sentence in Romans 4.23 and Galatians 3.6. Luther wrote, Upon this text, Paul bases the central article of our faith, which both the world and the devil hate, namely that faith alone justifies and saves. Luther continues explaining to how faith means nothing else than to assent to God's promises and to trust that they are absolutely true and dependable. Our righteousness before God is simply this, that we trust in the divine promise of Christ. Faith, that is, the steadfast and unwavering reliance on God's grace in Christ. Luther argues is what saves, not the works of the law. After all, Abraham believed before the law had been given. Luther thundered, we are then justified and saved alone by divine grace, which imputes to us Christ's righteousness. Upon this passage, therefore, rests our whole Christian doctrine, that we who believe in Christ are justified before God alone by the grace of God. Such a faith justifies not as our own work, but faith itself is the work of God. This understanding of justification by faith through grace arguably is the heart of the Reformation. 
Just as important, I assume that the doctrine of justification by faith is the heart of our heart as Protestants. What could possibly be wrong, therefore, with Luther's use of this sentence to remind us that our salvation is not our doing, but rather what God has done for us? Surely Luther was right to direct our attention to the centrality of this sentence in the letters of Paul. I have no reason to deny either of these claims. My worry is that the use of this sentence to sum up the gospel can tempt those who identify ourselves as Christians to forget our salvation comes from the Jews. Moreover, when we lose the Jews, we lose our heavenly Savior. And when we lose our heavenly Savior, we no longer believe or better desire that our humiliated bodies be transformed into the body of his glory by being made citizens of heaven. You've got to be thinking, what did he just say? <laughs> the connection between God's promise to Abraham, what it means to live lives determined by the cross of Christ, the glorification of our bodies so that we become citizens of heaven is hardly clear. But let me at least try to make the connections by suggesting that what is at stake is the recognition that our salvation is about the engrafting of our bodies into a politics begun by God's promise to Abraham. The emphasis on justification by faith as the summation of the gospel can tempt us to forget our salvation entails that we're made citizens of people and by being so made is our salvation. When I lived among the Lutherans, and I had no idea Lenore Ryan was going to be here today. <laughs> My Lutheran experience was Augustana. When I lived among the Lutherans, for example, I discovered that the doctrine of justification by faith alone, a doctrine that should provide a profound sense of joy, often produced a deep anxiety among my Lutheran friends. Lutherans were haunted by the thought that they might not be justified by their faith. Accordingly, they worked very hard at believing that they believed that they were justified by their belief that they were justified by faith. <laughs> faith, I, I'll let you know, whether, tell me whether that's true or not. Faith so understood turned out to be an act of believing which did not require you to actually drag your body to church. Even more ironic, faith understood is trying very hard to believe what was hard to believe is exactly what Luther meant by a work. There is another small problem, moreover, that when the emphasis upon justification is made the heart of the gospel, it is not clear why Jesus ended up on a cross. If his preaching was to assure those to whom he preached that they were saved by faith alone, why was Herod trying to kill him? If the gospel is the proclamation that you are accepted, an unfortunately vulgarized but widespread account of justification, it surely seems to be a profound mistake to try to kill someone like Jesus who allegedly had his central message that all we need to do is to accept our acceptance. Nor do I think Luther's reading of God's reckoning Abraham righteous to be a problem about the relation of faith and works. Luther had no intention of denying the importance of work in his commentary on Genesis, for example. He says with no hesitation, that a faith without works is no faith at all. Faith stretches forth its hand and lays hold on what God has promised. The question for Luther was not whether works or the virtues follow upon faith, but rather that faith prior to producing works itself justifies sinners. Luther, however, forcefully asserted that what must clearly be rejected is the pernicious doctrine of that faith obtains its value from love. The problem is not that Luther had no way to account for works, but rather Luther does not attend to the content of Abraham's belief. What Abraham believed is that he would have descendants that would be as numerous as the stars. 
the Lord reckoned Abraham righteous because Abraham believed that God would make him the father of a great people. God's declaration that Abram is righteous, the it that was what God reckoned, was a declaration about bodies. Abraham, a man past the age of begetting children, believed God would make him the father of a people. The righteousness that God reckoned Abraham to have is Abraham's belief he would be the father of a people who by their very existence manifest the glory of God. If justification by faith is isolated from Abraham's belief that he would be the father of a people, the result has been and can be disastrous. Thus Luther's chilling judgment that the Jews are no longer God's people. According to Luther, the Jews have been rejected because of their unbelief. God promised to redeem the Jews at a definite time, Luther says, but obviously that has not happened. As a result, they cannot explain why for hundreds of years they have had to wander the earth without a home, a kingdom, or true worship. Luther proclaims that the Jews, quote, are no longer God's people, but have been rejected by him on account of their unbelief because they have refused to accept the Savior who God sent them. Luther missed the fact that even without a home, God's reckoning of righteousness to Abraham had been fulfilled. From generation to generation, Jews refused to let their homelessness, the persecution they endured often at the hands of Christians, stop them from having children. Abraham looked to the heavens to see what God had promised and his descendants reflected the heavens. God's reckoning of righteousness to Abraham is not some general declaration of acceptance, but rather the fleshly existence of a people who exists so the world might know that the God who called Abraham keeps his promises and refused to abandon us. Christians are no less fleshy, but there is a difference. Paul tells the Philippians that they are to imitate him by observing those who live according to the example he represents. But Paul is without wife and children. That is, he is without descendants other than the Philippians and us. That is a crucial fact. For it turns out that we believe on Paul's authority that those of us who follow Christ are Abraham's heirs. We are, moreover, no less bodily than the Jews. But the bodies we bring to the covenant are bodies determined by baptism through which we are made citizens of heaven. The Lord told Abraham that his people would be as numerous as the stars of heaven. It is therefore no accident that Paul tells the Philippians and us that our citizenship is heavenly. Heavenly citizenship does not sound bodily, but that at least if we attend to Paul's claim in his letter to the Philippians, it is in heaven that we're given our true bodies. For it is from heaven that we expect the Lord Jesus Christ, whose body will transform our bodies, our humiliated, bo our humiliated bodies, into the body of Christ's glory. We wonder what could that possibly mean? In his kingdom and the glory, the Italian political philosopher Giorgio Agabin has suggested that the emphasis upon the glory by Christians is paradoxical. It is so because glory is the essential property of God's eternity, 
which means nothing can increase or diminish God's glory. Yet we're told that all creatures are obligated to glorify God. Agamben argues that God would desire his creatures to glorify him is contradictory because God's glory means he needs nothing. What Agamben misses, however, is that the glory God would have us reflect is the glorified body of Christ in which we have been invited to participate. That body, the body of Christ, is the body we participate in through this meal we share. It is that body, a body that is learned like Jews to live in diaspora. God reckons righteous in this time after the Reformation, a time when Christians must learn again how to live in a world in which we are not at home. It becomes all the more important we learn from the heirs of Abraham. To so live means we will be without security of place other than heaven. But surely that is the grandest security to be had. Even more wonderful, God has given us all we need to go on. That is, he has given this meal of bread and wine, a body and blood of Jesus to sustain us on the journey. If we are to live faithfully in this time after the Reformation, let us live as confident and bold bodily creatures who trust as Abraham trusted that by so living our bodies might reflect the glory of the one alone capable of making us citizens of heaven. At the very least, I should think that might mean that because we have been reckoned righteous through the cross and resurrection of Christ, we manifest an infectious joy because we have no doubt that the Lord reckoned Abraham and us righteous. We are citizens of a heavenly politics that makes it possible for us to be a people who are an alternative to worldly politics based on the presumption that God did not keep his promise to Abraham. But God did reckon Abram righteous, and on that our salvation depends. Amen.